Hey, welcome back to Barley and Hops. Uh, we're going to do another quick video today, and this one's going to be on doing a corn mash. Uh, I've had a lot of requests for this, uh, and I thought, man, this is great. I always wanted to do this one. Um, we're going to do a corn mash right here, uh, and I'm going to show you how we do it. Uh, and remember, there, there are literally hundreds of techniques. So, so don't take this as gospel. This is just a technique that works. There are many, many others. So, uh, you know, if you get into that, well, you know, he said this, and then I always did it that way. Well, by golly, if that, the way you do it works, continue doing it. This is really just a good opportunity for me to explain some specifics about what's going on, and you can use any technique you like. Um, I recommend a couple of books for you. I mean, one really good one is called Home Distilling by Rick Morris. Uh, it's a really good book. It, it covers a lot of great information. There's another one uh, called Moonshine. Uh, and Moonshine's written by a guy named Matthew Raleigh. Uh, really good, easy read. It really does clarify a lot of stuff for you. Uh, it, it'll give you a really good basis of history of Moonshine and the advent of the uh, more popular stills and how things go. All right. uh, and then there's John Palmer's uh, How to Brew. Uh, this is a really good book. It's actually uh, written for uh, beer brewing, but a, a lot of the aspects of distilling uh, and preparing a mash are exactly the same as brewing beer. So it gets into a lot of explanation about enzymes, you know, the alpha amylase, the beta amylase. Uh, it gets into a lot of explanations uh, in the real scientific area of, uh, of distilling and extracting sugars, fermentable sugars, things like that. So it's a, it's, it's a really handy read, but it's, and of course, none of these are absolutely necessary. You, you can do without them. Uh, but I recommend them if you've, got, if you've got nothing else to do, just go ahead and read. Um, today what we're going to do, I've got about three, a little over three gallons of water here, and I'm using the Pick, uh, New Wave Pick Titanium Hot Plate. Uh, it's a magnetic induction uh, cook, cooktop. I, I love the thing because I can set it in five degree increments, and I want to get this at 155 degrees, which is right where I'm at now. So I'm going to leave it at 155 degrees. And the reason for that is that the action that I want to take place within my flake corn uh, happens at 155 degrees. So I've got four pounds of flake corn, and then I've got two pounds of six row. Uh, in the six row barley, uh, this is a malted barley. The six row barley, um, the best way to explain it, it's got 160 diastatic power. Uh, and look, don't let that be a, a weird term to you. What that really means is that uh, on the scale, it's 160. One of the highest ones that we have is a six grain, uh, six row. Uh, it only takes 35 to convert itself, its own starches, to fermentable sugars. Uh, and everything left over will convert anything you add to it, add with it. So, you know, any adjunct, corn, flake corn, and, or, or some other type of adjuncts that you want to add to it. Uh, so you've got, this way you don't have to use alpha amylase. Uh, without this, we would be required to, in, introduce some alpha amylase, but it's already resident here inside the grain, so we're going to take advantage of that. So it's not as much for flavor as it is for converting uh, starches into fermentable sugars. I'm going to place all of that inside one of these uh, nylon bags, and just be careful, this new wave, if you put it on sear, which I'm going to do right now as a matter of fact, because yeah, I want to heat it up to about 160, because once I drop the grains in, of course it's going to drop. Uh, the temperature is going to drop, and I want it to start happening right away. So I'll put it on sear. I'll let that thing heat up a little bit more. And then uh, I'm going to add the corn and the barley together. And then we're going to put it inside here. We're going to let it set and steep at 155 for about, about an hour. Uh, and then what we'll do is we'll stop then. So when I come back to you, uh, it's, uh, it'll be a, had been about an hour. And then we're going to just test it. And I'll, I'll show you how to test it to find out whether your starches uh, have converted to fermentable sugars or not. Uh, but that's really about all there is to it. Now, one addition that I always make, now this is totally up to you, and again, a lot of this is personality driven. So, I always add 10 pounds of corn sugar. Uh, this is uh, one bag of five pounds. I always add 10 pounds or so of corn sugar to uh, my mash when I make a five gallon batch. And the reason I do that is I'm trying to increase the alcohol by volume in the mash. And let me explain that. If, if I, and I'm, my, my goal is about 20%, as close to 20 as I get it. 20% uh, of five gallons is one gallon. So I've got all the flavor from the corn and anything else I use in the mash. And if I increase the alcohol volume with that flavor, I'm gonna, I can anticipate distilling about one gallon of a five gallon batch, 20%. 
Uh, and with that, I've got a quality product and my quantity is going to be almost a gallon. It, it'll run a little bit short. Uh, now, if I only have a 10% alcohol by volume, of course, my outcome is only going to be about a half a gallon. So, I mean, it just kind of makes sense. There's a correlation. It just kind of makes sense. I'd rather put all the effort and work and hard work into uh, to distilling because the distilling process, it's a little long, a little lengthy, and wind up with a gallon as opposed to a half a gallon. But then again, it's totally up to you. Now, this kind of begs the question, what if I want one gallon and I don't want to use corn sugar? Well, John Palmer's book will explain that in great detail about how to go through the mashing process with an extremely high amount of grains. Because you can get the same results without adding any sugar, but we can do this by just adding sugar to it. So we're going we're gonna to spike the fermentable sugars with corn sugar. Um, so that's it. Uh, except for, will table sugar work? Absolutely. Table sugar works. Uh, it's about 15% non-fermentable sugars, but that's okay because it's just a little tiny residual sweetness left over. And again, table sugar is a little bit cheaper. Can you use molasses? Absolutely. What about honey? Oh, what about brown sugar? All of those are fermentable sugars. So yes, you can. The amounts that you use and the combinations are, are totally up to you. You're only limited to your imagination. A lot of it is going to be trial and error. There are some rules of thumb, but the trial and error is going to get you through the day. And my, my rule of thumb when it comes to sugar is about 10 to 12 pounds per five gallons. Uh, and everything else is flavoring. So we'll be back with you in probably about 60 minutes. I'm going to put this together in a bag. I'm going to tie a string to it. I'm going to tie it to the side of the pot so it, it kind of stays up and it doesn't melt on the bottom. You don't want that to happen uh, because it defeats the purpose of having the bag. And the reason for the bag, in my opinion, is so that I can remove the corn and I can remove all the grain because I've gotten everything I want out of it. And then when I go into my fermenter, which I'll use the fast fermenter, when I do that, all I'm putting in there is fermentable sugars in a wash base and I'm not, there's no grain in there because I've, I've got to filter it anyway. I've got to get all of that out. I'd rather take it out from the very beginning uh, than to introduce anything like that into my still which could scorch and once you scorch it, uh, you're not going to get that flavor out. You've just got to redistill it. Uh, but I mean, now, can you do this without a bag? Absolutely. Just remember, once you finish, uh, you know, once you finish fermenting or before you go into the fermenter, at some point before you distill, you're going to have to remove all of those grains and remove all of that corn or else you stand a good chance of scorching everything inside that pot. Hey, we'll okay, welcome back. It's been minutes. a little bit over 60 minutes now. Um, I know this has all stopped. It's all happened. I've, I've converted all those starches into fermentable sugars. I'm confident that I've done that. Now, I asked you, I know, I asked you to trust me. Uh, but now I'm going to give you some proof. And this is a way you can test it. You can find out whether your process or whatever you've done has converted those starches into fermentable sugars. And we're going to use iodine to do that. Now, but before we get to that, I just want to let you know that, you know, cornmeal works too. Uh, this is a pound of cornmeal. Uh, it cost me like a dollar, dollar four cents. No, this is two pounds. Uh, two pounds of, of cornmeal. Uh, and you can actually do the same thing. Or, or you can use, and we're going to do one later. We're going to do another mash later with just cornmeal and amylase enzyme. But I'm going to prove to you now that the amylase actually does convert those starches into fermentable sugars. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to use, first of all, uh, my test is a potato. And everybody knows that a potato is full of starch. Uh, then I have a little bit of this mash that I collected at the very beginning and I saved it. I set it aside. And then I've got the mash that's completed now that I just dipped out of there. Uh, so I'm just going to add a little bit of iodine to all three of those and I'm going to show you what happens. Uh, this is pretty amazing uh, and it's a real simple test. You don't have to do this every time. Uh, you do it once and then you're convinced and then after that you don't have to worry about trying to use iodine anymore. But this is, and also this is a good way to you know, prove to your kids want to do a science project or your friends. Now watch this. We know that a potato is full of starch. So when we add some iodine to it, you'll see how it starts to turn black. You'll notice the blackness in that. You see how quickly it turns black? And if you allow that to set for a while, it'll turn a very, very dark black. You'll see how it's doing that now. And, and that's only because of the iodine interacting with the starch molecules that's inside this potato. Now, the very same thing would happen uh, if you have starch inside your mash. Now watch this. This is really interesting. I'm going to put a couple of drops in this. And look how dark that has become. That's become black. 
And that's because you've got a lot of starch molecules in there. Now, once you've used the amylase out of the six row with your corn, and you've allowed it to steep for 60 minutes, all that action takes place. Now watch this. And you put in a couple of drops. And you'll, just, you'll notice the color of the iodine is there. But then when you shake it up, just a little, it's gone. Uh, so that means that there's no starch left, as opposed to this one. When you shake it up, it stays black. So that's a way that you can actually prove your hypothesis or your theory about converting starches into fermentable sugars. Uh, this is an amazing process. And like I said, you don't have to do it every time, but it works. I mean, this, this is iodine uh, tincture. Iodine tincture, I got this at uh, Walgreens for like three bucks. You can get them at it, just most any store that's got a little small pharmacy in it. So but use iodine, and iodine will always give you an idea of whether or not uh, you've converted starches into fermentable sugars. So in just a moment here, I'm going to go ahead and remove all of these uh, grains. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use, uh, I will use my strainer and I'll dip these out and, until I get the bag small enough to where when I remove the bag, it doesn't go everywhere. Uh, and then we're going to continue on with the next step, which is to uh, add our sugars and more water. And then we're going to put it in a fast ferment. I'm going to add my yeast and my yeast nutrient. And then I'm just going to put I'll it in the corner and let it ferment just to make the bag smaller so it's a little bit easier to maneuver with. And while I was doing that, you know, I, was, I rinsed them out a little bit. <laughs> now remember, I've got 155 degrees. I've got to get it down to fermenting temperature. And in order to get it down to that fermenting temperature, uh, I'm just going to add some cold water to it. And I'll take advantage of the cold water. I'll use that. To, and that's what I've been doing, just to rinse whatever I've got in there, which is going to be all the fermentable sugar stuck inside those grains and wrapped all around it. So that's all okay, I'm doing hey, right welcome now. Back. I'll be back with We've, you. Uh, I threw the ice in there, kind of cooled it down a little bit. I added a little bit more water. Uh, we're down to right at 70 degrees, so that's perfect temperature for me. What I've done is uh, I've, I put in a little bit extra water, a little bit over five gallons, because when I remove the ball on the bottom of my fast ferment to dump the yeast, uh, I'm going to sacrifice a little bit of this mash. So I just want to make sure I have enough in here so when I put it into my five gallon still that I'm at five gallons. I've already checked the gravity. It's 1.120. So I'm looking at about probably about 17%, maybe 18% ABV uh, potential. Uh, I could probably get a little bit more out of it if I add more sugar, but I'm, look, I'm like, I'm really happy with that. So I'm going to leave it as is. Uh, I've added the yeast nutrient, two ounces of that. Um, in short, look, if you don't have yeast nutrient, and I've read, I haven't tried it yet, but uh, I've read that tomato paste, a little eight ounce can of tomato paste does the same thing, or something very similar. Uh, and I've also added the yeast. And the yeast, uh, the way I did that, you know, I keep my yeast, this is Daddy, the distiller's active dry yeast. I get it out of its foil bag, and I put it in a plastic bag, keeping it in a refrigerator. Uh, I just, uh, my uh, exact measurements uh, for this, for a five gallon batch, is just one big heap of teaspoon or tablespoon, uh, and then a half. So I use a one and a half tablespoons. Uh, other than that, that's, uh, that's really all there is to it. So look, if you have any questions, give us a call. Uh, like us on Facebook. Um, if I would, uh, like this video. Uh, so join our channel, uh, keep track of what's going on. And if you have any questions, or if you need anything, or if you want us to do a specific video, just drop us a line, let us know. All right, you have a good one and happy distilling.